This is the Washington Week Webcast Extra. I'm John Dickerson in for Gwen, and I'm joined around the table by Indira Lakshmanan of Politico Magazine, Jennifer Jacobs of Bloomberg Politics, Lisa Lehrer of the Associated Press, and Jeff Zeleny of CNN. So, Jeff, taking a deep look into the campaign spending so far, what did we learn? One thing we learned, uh, courtesy of our, friends, of our friends at the Washington Post this week, um, was that Bernie Sanders, of all people, has spent the most money of any candidate um, on ads and other things, $166 million. Now, Bernie Sanders has made a lot of hay over the fact that he does not collect uh, big checks. His average donation is $27, uh, all of which is true. So that is a lot of $27 average contributions that uh, are, are paying for his ads. And he had um, also some news this week that he was laying off uh, staff members. That's one of the things that we sort of never have a firm handle on is how many people are actually working for these campaigns because there are volunteers and other things. I was surprised to learn that at some point he had 1,000 people working yeah. for him, and now it's back down to around 300 or so. They really started to um, have a robust staff, a robust presence on TV, outspending uh, the uh, Clinton campaign uh, after Iowa and New Hampshire. The money started pouring in and they started spending it. Well, an interesting detail in this story in the Washington Post that uh, um, sort of, you know, was just looking at, uh, at uh, uh, spending reports through March, so it's more than that now, is that $91 million of that uh, went to ad makers and ad buyers and other things. Now, that sounds like an eye-popping number. It <laughs> is. Uh, it's not that people are lining their uh, pockets with all of this. It costs money to make ads and put them on television, but that is a lot of money. And the, it was eye-popping, I'm told, to people in Burlington, Vermont, uh, to the Sanders specifically. And it's not something that the Sanders campaign ever anticipated that they would have this much money to play with. The Clinton campaign filed the Obama playbook of from 08 and 12 of putting um, spending limits and caps on um, on their outside advisors and consultants so they would not sort of profit so uh, uh, richly from this. The Sanders campaign never anticipated being able to raise this much money and that's what uh, little, has and happened. It is a little counterintuitive for a movement campaign to have so many professionals and have so many ads. It's kind of got both. And his ads were great. His ads, yeah. I think, were, were some of the best of the cycle. In fact, the best of the cycle, I think, like in many respects. But, uh, you know, it's uh, expensive. The Simon and Garfunkel ad, classic. Sure, yeah. yeah. Dear, let me ask you about the, the piece that you wrote about Hillary Clinton. You talked about her time as Secretary of State and her time as a candidate. She does not enjoy campaigning, as she has said. So she's probably wanting to win, if for no other reason than it would get her back into the mode of operation that she does enjoy. What would being president be like for her, based on what she, what life was like as Secretary of State? You're, you're absolutely right when you say back to what she enjoys, and it's so evident in her. Her whole demeanor changed. I mean, I describe in the article how having covered her for an entire year, 2007 to 2008, and then my boss transferred me off the politics beat and said, "Now you're going to be." The Secretary of State, can, uh, you know, reporter, and I thought, oh my gosh, more of that because it wasn't very pleasant covering the Clinton campaign in 2008. I can tell you, it was hard because there was a real distrust of the press. She was not comfortable on the trail. From the very first moment she walked to the back of the plane on her first trip as Secretary of State, it was like invasion of the body snatchers. It was a totally different person. She was warm. She was relaxed. She was comfortable. She was welcoming everybody. She was like, this is what we're going to be doing on this trip to these cities. She had clearly inhaled her briefing book, had learned every point in every city we were going to, and, you know, she seemed so comfortable carrying Barack Obama's message overseas. And I realized over the course of the next four years, she's right when she says, I'm much better when I actually have a job to do than when I'm fighting to get that job. She sort of, as I said, she becomes comfortable in her skin. She gets to be a policy maker. She's not just a wonk, but she actually gets to do the stuff that she is the whole reason she got into politics. In the state department, I was told over those four years that the professionals who were there, the foreign service professionals, said that she managed the department very well, that they had a feeling that, you know, everything was sort of being taken care of, that she did have a sort of management sense that not all the other secretaries of state have had. Um, and she had certain priorities, like women's empowerment, that I'm not saying that John Kerry doesn't care about women's empowerment. I'm sure he does. But he hasn't championed it personally in the same way that Hillary right. Clinton did. Lisa, one of the things we didn't talk about on the show in terms of this pivot to the general election for Hillary Clinton is that they are planning already for 
uh, well, for vice presidents, but also right. for a convention. So tell us a little bit about what the, the Clinton convention might look like, if she's the nominee, which we, looks like she might be. Well, so as um, Jeff mentioned in our show this week, she spent a couple days at home in New York, and part of what she was doing there was thinking about the convention, thinking about the vice presidential pick. We're at the very early stages. We know it's going to be in Philadelphia. Uh, one problem that they're starting to grapple with is there's an awful lot of high-profile speakers on the Democratic side to be fit into that primo. 10 to 11 o'clock hour. So you have, of course, the president, the vice president, Hillary Clinton, her vice president, whoever that is, former president Bill Clinton, Michelle Obama, who has a strong following, and perhaps Bernie Sanders. So how you... And let's throw in a little Chelsea Clinton, too. You got Chelsea to Clinton. Right. right the whole the family. The baby. Baby yeah. Charlotte. You oh know. Um, so you have a... that. Everyone, you want to get those prime speakers in that last hour, really in the last part of that hour, because the gold standard for these convention planners is that bleeds over into the top of the local news at 11. And, you know, these local news watchers see their primo speaker addressing them. <laughs> so that's a lot of um, people with, uh, with who are prominent Democratic surrogates, also who want their time uh, in that hour. So they're grappling with that. They're trying to figure out how best to use the city. Uh, they're looking to Obama's rally in 2008 in the Mile High Stadium in Denver, which is a really iconic moment in that campaign. It's something maybe they could try to replicate in Independence Hall. Right, although yeah. it was an iconic moment because it had an iconic candidate, which is the <laughs> what slight, are you saying? perhaps, difference. What are you saying? Yeah. Uh, and then on the VP front, you know, there's, start, there's a lot of names out there. We all in Washington love a good VP stakes. Uh, there's at least two dozen names that are being vetted and floated around Washington. That'll be called down to a smaller list is what uh, we were told this week. Um, and, you know, there's there's sort of an internal debate that's sort of interesting uh, between the people around the Clintons about whether you want someone who can bolster you in the Rust Belt, someone who can maybe uh, win back those, a real liberal that could win back those Bernie Sanders supporters and maybe cut into some of the people who might leave for Trump. Or, you know, she really won with a lot of help from minority voters. Do you want to recognize and respect that contribution and that support with another historic first? Um, you know, that's something we'll have to figure out, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of debate and something we'll be speculating on an awful lot yeah. over the next Yeah, six there weeks. might even be somebody at this table on the short list for VP. You never know. A, I had just about everyone in list. Washington yeah, is on that exactly. list these days. Um, Jennifer, on, on Donald Trump, when he moves to the general election, is going to have a problem, which is he's going to need a lot of money. And he has campaigned relentlessly on this idea that he's self-funded, which isn't quite true. Not quite. Not true. But he's really can't, he really can't be self-funded for the general because it costs so much more money. So how's he going to do it? And also, he's made a second pledge, which is sort of he's not going to let people, sort of these influence peddlers, these ones who've messed everything up, um, lobbyists, even though he now has a campaign manager who was a lobbyist. Um, how's he going to do that? Get fund the campaign and also keep out all the people who've rigged the system that he is so uh, upset with. Right. That's the big fascinating question. We all want to know, what is he going to do? So Mitt Romney raised about just over a billion dollars, but of that, about $250 million was the fundraising costs. So if, if Donald Trump were to give money to his own campaign, he perhaps wouldn't have to raise or to do a, a full billion dollars. Maybe it's only $800 million. But he has so many people who are, the, you know, the small donors like we were talking about with Bernie Sanders. He, he could foster some of those Facebook followers and Twitter followers into giving him smaller donations where, you know, maybe he could get away with saying, you know, I'm not dealing with the big donors. And who knows if the big donors would even write him a check, right? And who knows if even the most talented fundraising, you know, uh, operatives in the GOP would be willing to help him raise money. So there's a whole bunch of questions. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, all of you. We've got lots of questions in the future. Good. <laughs> we'll all be back. <laughs> Thanks for that added bit of analysis. Now, be sure to check out our Washington Weekly quiz and test your knowledge of the week's events. That's at pbs.org slash Washington Week. I'm John Dickerson. Be sure to join us on the next Washington Week webcast extra.